I'm Jeffrey Villard Owen, and I am hoping in the next series of videos to demonstrate some of the characteristics of medieval soldiers and armies based on historical sources and illustrated by the work of Mordas using the Medieval 2 Total War game. I am also hoping to illustrate some of the battle tactics as described in the original sources whenever that is possible. We are fortunate in the case of Byzantium in having numerous military manuals used by the generals of those armies. The latest, most comprehensive work was that of the Tactica of Leo the Wise, compiled in the early 10th century and containing much of the information used in previous manuals but updated with modernized terminology and additional material. The manual was further updated by Emperor Nikephorus Botaniatis in the 11th century. It appears to have been read by Georgius Paleologus, one of the most senior Byzantine generals of the 12th century, and it remained possibly in use until the fall of Constantinople in 1204. A copy of the military manual and other Byzantine manuscripts ended up in Italian libraries shortly after that time, and these manuscripts were translated into Latin and eventually into Italian in the following centuries. So there is some reason to believe that the Tactica were in use possibly up to 1204, potentially even later, if copies existed in other places under Byzantine control. As no newer versions of the military manual are known to have survived, it may be that this was the definitive edition in use from the time of Leo the Wise onwards, as long as copies existed. One of the most significant characteristics of the Byzantine army was the institution of pronia, that is, of military freeholds. These were given to soldiers in exchange for lifelong military service, they were tended by servants and were tax-free, hence the term freeholds. One reason for this was that, with the advent of Christianity, it became increasingly difficult to recruit soldiers, men whose job was to kill, perhaps the greatest sin imaginable. The Byzantine Empire often resorted in hiring foreign mercenaries or paying peripheral vassal states to do some form of border duty to minimize the need for a large armed force that was hard to raise, not least due to the moral difficulties. Following the widespread Slavic and Bulgarian raids of the 7th to 9th century, however, large areas of the empire became depopulated and some of the empty lands were eventually turned into military freeholds. The system of military freeholds is mentioned in Leo's Tactica and appears to have been in use in the reign of his father Basil I and therefore likely predates the 10th century. It is clear from the Tactica that the holders of the freeholds were not just cavalry, as it is sometimes assumed. It rather appears that practically the entire body of infantry and the lances of the cavalry were pronias. Section 4.1 Choose soldiers from the theme under your command, neither too young nor too old, rather brave, strong, physically fit, courageous and well-to-do, so that, in case of necessity, that is why they are in your army and in your camp, they may have at home workers who shall work their land, and moreover, so that they may fully afford the costs of their armament, given that they shall have no other obligations to the state, that means they would not have to pay taxes. That passage, and others like it elsewhere, seems to suggest that every soldier would have been a pronia, and certainly not just the cavalry, and it is therefore mistaken to see the pronia as some kind of feudal parallel in the Byzantine Empire. They were not aristocrats. The land was leased by the emperor and did not belong to the pronia, and the lease was in exchange for military duty, and there can be nothing further removed from the system of feudalism inasmuch as the authority was centralized and the pronia had substituted the Roman legionary who killed for money, which would have been unthinkable for a good Christian. 
The Proniars were accompanied by either one of their sons or a servant, sometimes two, during campaigns, and these companions fought as lightly armed troops. The less experienced were given the task of defending the camp during a battle. The more experienced fought as missile troops or as more lightly armed spearmen. One can expect that most of the phalanx were proniars and possibly some of the missile troops and probably all the lancers. The proniars of the infantry were armed in this manner. First the archers. Section 6.2 Full male armour down to their ankles, held together by leather and metal harnesses along with sheaths for their weapons. Moreover, iron helmets with a small tuft at their apex, bows suiting their physical strength, but no stronger, preferably weaker, in broad sheaths, so that they may be kept under tension with replacement bowstrings in their pockets, a covered quiver that may hold 30 or 40 small arrows. They should additionally carry Roman-style double-edged swords on their shoulders and additional single-blade swords by their side. So, that was a description of the Byzantine archer, next to Scutati, once known as Hoplites. Section 5.3 Sharpen swords, shields, these may be great shields that are called thurios, or small infantry shields, those ones called peltai, or round iron shields, and an eight cubit contos. The cubit was a measure of length around 44 centimeters, so a Byzantine short spear would have been three and a half meters in length. It is said in the same paragraph that the Romans and Macedonians once made use of a long contos, 16 cubits in length, which is no longer necessary. It may be also worth noting here that the scutati were the same thing as the contorati, and they were all armed with swords as a secondary weapon, as we just read. Scutati, contorati, and spathari were not different types of soldiers. Then the paragraph continues. Still section 5.3. For anyone who wishes and can carry such weapons and find them useful, one may strap on themselves javelins, single-edged axes, battle axes with a sword point on one side, and long single-edged knives. Section 5.4 Body protection, if possible, chain mail, down to their ankles, held together by leather harnesses and metal rings. If full body chain mail cannot be had, then parts can be of bone or leather, moreover a tunic over their armor, breastplates of iron or another material, and complete helmets leg guards and arm guards of iron or another material if iron is not available, chain mail neck guards made of iron, dressed with wool on the inside and linen on the outside, gambesons for those who do not have iron breastplates, wide breastplates that can cover the soldier and his weapons, blowguns with short darts, slings, fire steel and tinder, these were used to light fires, nets, iron shoes with spikes, and horse armor, an iron chaffron to protect a horse's head, a patrol of iron or gumbeson to protect a horse's chest, and a crinier to protect a horse's neck. The manual repeats the above in a subsequent chapter, adding further details. Section 6.25 Arm the infantryman, once called the hoplite, with a sword, contos, shield, 
or necessary of the long type called therios, otherwise of the round standard type. The shields should be uniformly coloured for each regiment or brigade, and the men should have tufted helmets, slings, double-edged battle axes, one side with a blade, but the other as a spear point, carried in leather sheaths, or else axes with one side sharp and the other blunt, else double-sided axes with sharp edges on both sides. The best men in a squad, squads were generally arranged in a file, should wear a coat of mail, if possible everyone, but at least the first two in each file. They should be flying small flags from the tip of their spears when they are resting on their shoulders, that is, not in battle, and they should wear arm guards, either of iron or wood, and similarly leg guards, especially those who are placed at the front and rear of each file. That also gives us the impression that men fought in Fallon's formation. Section 6.26 The Scutati should be armed as already mentioned, while the missile troops should be armed in the following manner. The quivers carried on their shoulders should have enough space to carry 30 to 40 arrows on themselves. Extra arrows were carried in the baggage train. They should carry blowguns for smaller darts that may be thrown at the enemy and are useless to them. Arm with javelins those unable to use a bow or those who, as it often happens, do not have one. Additionally, they should carry small round shields, slings and axes like those already mentioned in leather sheaths. Their tunic should be short and if possible they should have an additional tunic over their coat of mail. That was the armour of the genuine Pronia Soldier, the Foot Soldier as well as the Lancer. The Foot Soldiers of the Byzantine Phalanx were known as Scutati. The mounted Lancers were known as Defensors in juxtaposition to the Cursors, the missile cavalrymen. These were usually non-Byzantine mercenaries. In the next part, I will try to go over the battle deployment of the Byzantine army and their battle tactics. Thank you for watching.